Thank you very much, Lance. We now have an icy cold room for <laughs> the icy cold intellect and indeed the icy cold aesthetic of Don Patterson. Um, clearly, it's the kind of day when people are selling things, punting things. <laughs> and I think the reason that I picked up this gig is that I contributed a chapter to a book recently out, Don Patterson, Contemporary Critical Essays, edited by Natalie Pollard. I think it's a very good book, apart from my own contribution. I picked up the Scottish Identity chapter, which I'm kind of sick of, of doing for various collections. Um, and I mention that because I suspect in some ways Don Patterson himself would be somewhat wary about being labelled a Scottish poet, which is of interest. Uh, Patterson is a brilliant technician, and many of the essays in here feature or um, comment on that technical ability. There's also an interview with him, which is very interesting. But uh, the question I kind of want to pose as I speak to the half dozen texts that are prescribed uh, for schools, the question I want to pose is, is Don Patterson accessible at schools level, or is he inaccessible? And I think the answer is a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. And I'm kind of interested in the extent to which Patterson might or might not end up being taught in schools. And to take a quick poll, has anyone here taught Patterson? So there are about half a dozen hands. Anyone intending to teach Patterson? Not after you hear this, but... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, that, that's interesting. He is a difficult poet, and there's nothing wrong with that. But let's think a bit about um, that kind of issue. Two of the poems that are chosen um, for schools are sonnets. Uh, they're both about childhood, about parent-child relationship. And I think these do represent rather accessible texts. Waking with Russell uh, begins, Whatever the difference is, it all began the day we woke up face to face like lovers, and his four-day-old smile dawned on him again, possessed him, till it would not fall or waver. And I pitched back, not my old hard-pressed grin, but his own smile, or one I'd rediscovered. Now the first line there is, um, takes us into conventional sonnet territory. It is in iambic pentameter, short, long, short, long. And most of the lines in Waking with Russell are five stress lines, but they're not really conventional sonnet iambic pentameter. So you've got something that clearly looks like a sonnet, it's got 14 lines, it is a sonnet, but the expectations we might have of a Spenserian or a Shakespearean sonnet or whatever are not fulfilled after the first line. And also the rhyme scheme is less complex than most sonnets. Um, we've mostly got A, B, A, B, or A, B, half A, half B. There is a deliberate um, simplification of the rhyme. And the reason that I'm banging on about forum is I think what is being set up here, and this is important to, to realise with Patterson, is that he sets up the notion of the conventional sonnet, or the known, and then that doesn't quite work because thematically he's going into the unknown, which is to say his new experience, the narrator, or indeed the poet's new experience of parenthood. That's kind of how it works. And the other thing I want to point out about the irregularity formally is that instead of an octave and a sestet, our first complete syntactical unit that I've just read to you is six lines. So it's upside down. We've got a sestet coming first, in a sense. So just to point out that Patterson is messing around with forum. And one of the things that he's also doing, which is not typical to all that many sonnets, so I need to be careful thinking about this, is the run-on line also disrupts what we would normally think about in terms of sonnets. And one final thing, I won't get too boring about this, I'm going to pull back from all this formal stuff to some extent, but something else I'd want to point out is that we've got a rather promiscuous mix of feminine 
and masculine rhymes. Uh, remember, uh, basically, masculine rhyme is usually a rhyme on a final stressed syllable. Feminine rhyme falls, roughly speaking, on the second last syllable. The sonnet, in a sense, breaks down in the face of the unconventional, the unscripted experience of parenthood. I think that's how it works uh, formally. Now, with a good senior class, as with an undergraduate class at university, a good way into this sonnet, something I've done in the past, is to take Waking with Russell and put it alongside Tom Leonard's A Summer's Day, which is a 13-line poem, not really a sonnet, but of course it riffs on, it references Shakespeare's great sonnet, um, My Love is Like a... a shall, sorry, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer Day? That's the one. A bit of Burns almost crept in there. <laughs> um, so the Tom Leonard piece and the Patterson piece are both not quite sonnets. And um, my experience with undergraduates is instead of doing the boring thing and showing them a perfectly formed sonnet, they rather like to see the broken down, if I can call it that, sonnet of Patterson and Leonard. And it's a better way of working to what the rules of the sonnet might actually be. And I think you can do this also um, with schools. Now, this accessibility question with Patterson relates not also to his poetry, but to his work as an editor. And I'm going to say a bit more about Waking with Russell in a moment. But um, I would like to draw attention to a book that some of you may know, a very good anthology that Patterson produces, 101 Sonnets. One of the things that interests me here is that there are 12 or 12 and a half sonnets by Scots. If this was an English poet, you'd be lucky if you get two or three sonnets by Scots, I suspect. But you can put his own sonnet practice somewhat in context, at least for yourselves as teachers, I would suggest, by drawing on 101 sonnets. Now, his work as an editor also extends to that traditional rite of passage that most contemporary Scottish writers undertake. Uh, Andrew Hagen has done it, Robert Crawford has done it, Ian Rankin has done it. Produce a selection of Robert Burns. It's the must-do <laughs> thing for contemporary Scottish poets. And Don Patterson's selection of Burns is interesting in a number of ways. He more or less presents Burns as though he's a new poet. He viciously edits Burns down to a fairly small number of poems and songs. And the thing that outraged Burnsians at the time when this appeared a few years back was it's got about six or eight blank pages at the end. And the Burnsians all said, you can read more Burns in there. What's he doing? <laughs> now, what Don Patterson, I think, is deliberately doing is saying, how might Burns look if he was packaged, presented as a poet on the contemporary scene? And if you are thinking about Patterson, um, and especially if you might be one of those brave souls teaching perhaps Patterson and Burns, I would suggest an interesting tie-up is to have a look at that book. And you can do things uh, with, with, with that too. Anyway, Waking with Russell and The Thread, which I'll come to in a moment, are technically deviant sonnets but they tell you a lot about sonnet form itself. Waking with Russell is actually from Patterson's collection, Landing Light, 2003, and the title is a pun on the landing light put in place in the author's house for his baby twins, as well as betokening the new tenderness that his baby sons awaken in him. It's also a typical Patterson joke about treating poetic form lightly. Although this is double-edged, Patterson kind of implicitly and explicitly claims that he has a light touch with form. In fact, as I've said, he's technically very abstruse and he kicks the hell out of form. He kicks it around like a football, which becomes very sort of complicated. What we've also got in that landing light theme is a typical Patterson thing. It's a poem about the mystery of love. Um, it plays around with parental and sexual and romantic love. We don't usually expect sonnets to be about the former, about parental or family love. 
and at the time of its publication at least one outraged, disgusted Conservative reviewer mistook Patterson's waking with Russell for a gay text in quite a famous case. Interesting thing to do with your pupils is to find that review and show them this <laughs> as a perfect example of misreading. We all know that there are no right answers in poetry, but there are certainly some damned awfully bad answers <laughs> um, or interpretations, and that is one. Whatever the difference is, it all began the day we woke up face to face like lovers. What is the difference mentioned in the first line? Clearly it's the difference in the father who now has these babies. But that difference is never really spelled out. We've got the deliberately hackneyed cliches, he's a great recycler of cliches, of the roads, of the river, of the journey. Um, he gestures towards a notion of some kind of continuum, some kind of movement, perhaps towards growth. But this immature sonnet, this deliberately misfiring sonnet formally, actually implies that there is no particular journey to be gone on. Um, what we've got really is just the idea that yes indeed the love will be eternal for his, for his baby, it's it, it tender in, in, in that sense, but this everlasting love is not to be seen as anything particularly to be explained. It's not to be seen, I think, as anything that is spiritual or eternal in any bigger sense. Like a lot of, of modern poets, Patterson is a celebrator of the quotidian, the ordinary. He riffs on, he hits against the idea that's so apparent from post-romantic lyricism onwards that the job of the poet is to give big, transcendent, eternal ideas. This is one of the challenges of Patterson. Patterson is saying, I'm not giving you access to higher knowledge. I'm giving you the mundane. And that makes him quite difficult. Um... The thread is also about Patterson's baby twins, also from Landing Light. And um, to begin with, it's a bit more conventional. We've got a Petrarchan octave. It's a bit more conventional to begin with. Uh, we've got five stress lines in the ABBA, ABBA rhyme scheme. And this represents a kind of order after the events of the text have taken place. Because as the thread, of some of you will know, um, is about the fact that his baby son Jamie, the twin of Russell, only narrowly survives birth. And again, the thread mimics the form of many romantic sonnets. It's a love poem, but more widely about love, about the family. Jamie made his landing in the world so hard he ploughed straight back into the earth. Reminds me a bit of the line from Waiting for God, or the bleakest line, I think, in, in Western literature, which talks about giving birth astride a grave, expressing the futility of life. Uh, I must admit to finding the Patterson voice often a bit sour. I've been a huge admirer of his technical panache for over 20 years, but I've never grown to like what I take as his predominant narrative voice. If I'm honest, I find it a bit too knowing, too sour. In the thread, though, which refers to a thread of breath, which seemingly keeps the spark of life in the baby as it's born, there is something literally lusty, something joyous. And again, a comparative thing you could do, Robert this morning mentioned a poet's welcome to his love-begotten daughter, the Burns poem, poem about child, an interesting thing to, to pair that poem by Burns and the Patterson poem. Um, so, in the thread, the baby's born, um, it survives, and the narrator or the poet thinks back on events. And so today, I thank what higher will brought us to here, to you and me and Russ, the great twin engine swaying wingspan of us, roaring down the back of Kerry Hill. We've got a poem that's childlike in its perspective. The father and twins mimic an aeroplane as they career down the hill, fairly obviously. The noise of the family, their vibrancy, stands in defiance of the near-death experience of Jamie. But the higher will that's mentioned there, I think, is not necessarily some kind of deity, but is simply the sheer life urge, the will to live of Jamie. So again, we've got a text that looks conventional, that looks as though it's appealing to a deity, but in fact, it's not really, I think, a religious text at all. I don't think it could be read 
as a religious text, but maybe that's an open question. The idea of a slender thread as opposed to a great thread of life, again, is part of the minimalism of Patterson, which I think signals ultimately what is Patterson's existentialist outlook. I think if you were to pin him down philosophically, there's a kind of existentialism. Uh, human life is alone in an uncaring universe, and there are no grand narratives to explain it in any sense. Now the thread is holding all of us. Look at our tiny house, sun, the white dot of your mother waving. The poem celebrates life, family, even as the poet, I think, refuses to assign to it any higher purpose. And I wonder if, like me, some of you may hear an echo there, perhaps, of another poem. And that might be Edwin Muir's Childhood, which is a good poem to throw into the mix. Patterson, in recent years, has taught Scottish literature courses at St Andrews, and I suspect this may actually um, have come to some extent from that experience of, well, certainly of reading, of reading Muir. These sonnets are Patterson at his most accessible. Reasonably accessible also is 1100's Baldovin, said the West of Scotland man pronouncing or possibly mispronouncing the Angus town. Um, this is from Patterson's 1998 collection, God's Gift to Women, and again it's about childhood. The extended metaphor or conceit in 1100 Baldovin is that of the expedition, a big expedition, even though it's two young boys going on a local trip unaccompanied. We've got the nice touch in the poem of the bus stop as a steel flag at base camp as the boys wait for the bus. The poem is about the strangeness of what to growing ups are fairly straightforward routine <coughs> procedures. And the strangeness is heightened for the present day classroom due to the pre-decimalization nature of the currency. So the boy is thinking about what he's going to do with his money. I'm weighing up spending power, the shillings, tanners, black pennies, florins with bald kings, the cold blazonry of the half crown, thruppany bits like thick cogs, making them chank together in my pockets. I plan to buy comics, sweeties and magic tricks. The florin colloquially um, is the old two bob bit. We have throughout the poem a kind of trick where perspective is minute, it's close up one minute, the coins in the pocket, and larger the next, it mimics the excitement. The perspective is all over the place. Um, and we then shift perspective to his plans, his plans to buy comics, sweeties, and magic tricks. Put all this together, including the, the, the bus stop, a steel flag, and what we've got is an eye that is all over the place, a perspective that is all over the place. Um, and our narrator is worried about where he and his friend will end up on this wee trip through Angus. He hopes they will, quote, enter the land at the point we left off. They're fearful, almost in science fiction sense, that they won't be able to arrive back at the place from which they've come. And of course, it's a poem about childhood vulnerability. The kids are excited, but there is also a kind of vulnerability there. There's a lot to be unpacked in terms of childhood. But the poem, takes a sudden turn um, toward the end. It plunges the boys into the fearful terrain of actually becoming lost in time. Because the poem Time Travels, immediately following the line, enter the land at the point we left off, the boys are somehow fearful, or the poet is later imagining them to be fearful that they can't get back to that place in, in, in time. Immediately after that, we shift so that only our vo voices sound funny and all the houses are gone and the rain tastes like Kelly and black waves fold in very slowly at the foot of McAlpine roads and our sisters and mothers are 50 years dead. Difficult stuff. The enchantment is gone or in another sense, in its worse, a cursed sense, the enchantment is confirmed as the poet time travels, reflects on his childhood experience, and then draws attention to the fact that he is now an adult looking back on that, and of course mourning these dead relatives. Um, and what the poem ultimately says, I think, is that the child is right 
to be as wa to be wary about time because it brings change and adult woes. 1100 Moldovan is a nice text about the bitterness of maturity, about a kind of alienating move away from the childish state. You know, the thing that they don't tell you, that life actually gets harder and harder the older you get and not easier, which everyone under 35 thinks to be the, to be the case. <coughs> Quite difficult, I suspect, to work with that time shift in the classroom but the important thing is to emphasise the magic of poetry in a strange way alongside the belief in a strange world by the boy narrator. And you can have great fun talking about, is this actually ultimately a conventional romantic uh, poem in the sense that it says that poetry does transform experience, does allow you some control over experience. Two Trees from the Collection Rain 2009 is also part of the syllabus. And again, this plays with the idea of what poetry is supposed to do, what it can do. It is uh, very much the kind of text that Patterson is increasingly specialised in, where the poet stands nose to nose to the reader and says, do you want a square go? Because we're going to have one now. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, we're told the story of Don Miguel, who apparently grafts a lemon and an orange tree together. And through the years, we are told, they put forth nothing. <laughs> typical Patterson, the typical shaggy dog story in which he excels. We've got two 12-line stanzas of the text. We're told the story and, um, of Don Miguel establishing this grafted tree. And then... Um, we are given the kind of payoff um, where another man buys Don Miguel's house who had no dream, so who can say what dark malicious whim led him to take his axe and split the bowl along its fused seam, then dig two holes and know they did not die from solitude, nor did the branches bear a sterile fruit, nor did their unhealed flanks weep every spring, for those four yards that lost them everything, as each strained on its shackled root to face the other's empty, intricate embrace. They were trees, and trees don't weep or ache or shout, and trees are all this poem is about. <laughs> He's clearly been reading his Shakespeare, that nor, 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 I will be familiar to some of you. The other thing that I cannot believe Patterson's technical skill with in Jean Beaumont with the run on line. If I taught creative writing or how to write poetry, which thank God I don't, I would start in terms of modern poetry by saying the thing that your accomplished modern poet needs to master is the run on line. Because modern poetry more and more in its pro prosaic early 21st century presence depends on that run online and Patterson is an absolute master in what I've just um, read there and the way in which he handles the stress every line is for stress but every line is a bit irregular and yet the narrative flow maintains uh, actually I, th I think it's positively musical Patterson himself is a musician um, and technically it's brilliant. But sometimes the reader might feel a bit cheated by Patterson. He says, you want a drama, a story, an occurrence? Well, I'm not giving you one. And there is again a clever trick going on, though. The intelligent reader must come to the conclusion that the last line, in a sense, is a lie. Trees are not all this poem is about. At the very least, the poem is about what we expect from a story or a poem. And that even extends to the suggestion that it's ultimately not about trees at all, but about human emotion. You can argue that this is a poem about human emotion. And that's the kind of thing you would need to tease out, I would suggest, in the classroom. Many modern poets gesture towards a kind of flat Zen realism, a kind of poised spiritual atmosphere surrounding the materialist reality of the world. Um, you know, here's the physical material reality and that's all you've got. It looks as though he's doing that. But this poem, I think, is no Buddhist meditation. It's not saying, look at the tree and enjoy it for what it is. I think it's something different. The poem strips away anthropomorphic elements, pathetic fallacy,
But ultimately, it draws attention to these things that it's stripping away rather than the tree. That is the philosophical trick that's going on in the poem, which makes me think it better be a damned able senior class that you're working <laughs> with to try and um, to, to do this with them. Um, what we've got in the end um, is a poem not just about a hybrid gardening experiment, but a poem that's about human emotional investment and involvement, right? Where, as I say, standing toe to toe with the reader. We bring expectations and Patterson is going to smash us in the nose, right? That's sometimes, sometimes the, way, the way writers work, and we probably all know that. We are different from the trees. I wish I hadn't written that line. No, no. We are different from the trees. And the question remains open at the end. Are we superior or inferior to the trees in having emotions, in being sentient creatures like the fairies? And the, yeah, Sorry, I'm taking that too far. But the notion is about the sentient and the non-sentient. It's a poem about perception. It's about expectation in terms of story, story um, in terms of poetry. Now, in a sense, it gets worse in terms of um, Patterson's accessibility. Patterson's first collection, Nil Nil 1993, gives us the ferryman's arms and the eponymous Nil Nil. In the ferryman's arms, the narrator is waiting for a ferry, fe ferry even, waiting for a ferry, <laughs> and that serves me right for er earlier attacking the, the, the anti-gay critic. Um, he's waiting for a ferry and there's a pub and he's the only guy in the pub and he decides he'll have a pint of Guinness and he'll play himself at pool. And he does that out of boredom, but typically with Patterson, a long time, alongside this mundane reality um, where he's playing the game for the hell of it, what we've got also is the high cultural resonance. Charon taking the dead across the river to Hades or hell. It's not so much a conceit as a deliberately glib subtext. This idea of the futility of playing a game of pool, of writing a poem in the face of the meaninglessness of the universe, the certainty of death, um, these things amount to the best that the human being can achieve in life. A nil-nil draw. He is a, nil a nihilist or a... No, we're going to retreat from that one. You simply won't win, but even the draw is something worth having to be optimistic, perhaps. Couched in a rich vernacular argo, this is damned hard stuff. The narrator leaves his game behind and gets on the ferry. The boat chugged up to the little stone jetty without breaking the skin of the water, stretching as black as my stout from somewhere unspeakable to here, where the foaming lip musitates endlessly, trying with a nutter's persistence to read and reread the shoreline. It's the common modern literary dilemma, the embarrassment of being a poet, of being a creature so useless, there is no message for the poet to impart. But maybe, though I'm not sure that Patterson would salute this idea himself, there is the consolation of art, of making form with words from the formless, from the meaningless. It's the poet's own foaming lip that musitates or mutters a very archaic usage in his own nutter's persistence to make artistic sense of the world. Clever, but this is the Patterson that I actually rather begin to lose patience with, I must confess. Um, um, a Patterson trick, uh, which is a sort of typical bit of, of, of Patterson gamesmanship, is that the title poem, Nil Nil, doesn't open the collection of 1993, but closes it. I remember reading this in 1993 and thinking, this guy's the best living poet in Scotland, and I probably still believe that. I mean, he's te technically astonishing. He also writes about football, which of course is God's own game. Um, and in Nil Nil, we see the collapse of an old football club to the extent that its playing field becomes more notable for boys' fixtures. We view the grimy details of the half-time Satsumas, the dog on the pitch, then the boys' club sponsored by Skelly Assurance, then Skelly Dry Cleaners, then nobody, stud harrowed pitches with one in five inclines, grim fathers and perverts with old English sheepdogs <laughs> lining the touch, moaning softly. 
Now, there is a kind of nice humour here of the perverts masturbating under the sheepskin coat, <laughs> lining the touch. Try getting away with this and explaining to your, to your parents what you're, you're doing with your class. Um, <laughs> there is a, a poetic finesse collided with a very grim situation. Typical Patterson terrain. High poetic humour from the ridiculous in the series. Nil-nil actually undercuts its initial proposition because its initial do proposition, in a sense, is documentary realism. It's uh, black and white. It's uh, Scottish football from the 1910s to the 1960s. It's the Tanner Ball player. Um, it's the it's the huge um, the huge crowds um, dwindling. It's you know in the background are clubs like Third Lanark going out of existence, etc. Um, and we get the slide into obscurity. But there are so many club names pile up that what we end up with is a kind of Scottish national shibboleth. It isn't a particular story. It is actually a story about the decline of Scottish football, although ultimately it's about something bigger um, than, than that. Although the trajectory of the text narrative is forward through time, we witness the decline through time, it cunningly works backwards um, as towards the end of the football tale, we've got the appearance of the Tanner Ball player in the street. And what we then have is a very strange moment where the Tanner, Tanner Ball player um, neatly back heels a stone straight into the gutter, then tries to swank off like he meant it. And then an abruptly different piece of sequentiality intrudes, unknown to him, so the thing that he's kicked into the gutter is unknown to him, we're about to find out what it is, unknown to him, it is all that remains of a lone fighter pilot. He caught up with the plane on the ground just at the instant the tank blew and made nothing of him, save for his fillings, his tackets, his lucky half crown and his gallstone. His gallstone now anchored between the steel bars of a stank. The reductio ad absurdum here where the descent of football is reached with the substitution of a ball with um, the substitution of a ball with the gallstone of a dead fighter pilot is totally on expected and is kind of tragically ridiculous. What is it exactly that's, that's going on here? And then we've got another sudden shift from film, from the sepia-tinted film texture of the poem to prose as the poem ends with an italicised authorial voice addressing the reader, informing him or her, this is where you go off, reader. I'll continue alone on foot in the failing light, following the trail as it steadily fades, the plot thinning down to a point so refined not even the angels could dance on it. Goodbye. <laughs> now, um, by the end, we've got a thoroughly syncretic construction. He's taken stories from all over the place. It looks as though there's something realistic like, going on, but ultimately it ends in a kind of ridiculousness and a kind of shaggy dog story. Nil-nil is on the syllabus and it's difficult in a number of ways. Is, what do you do with that? Do you say it's ultimately just a very willful poetry that's a poetry for the joy of it? Or are there other things you can do in terms of inviting people to read the realism of the poem. I'm very sceptical about that because the realism is exploded. You think you're getting realism and it's exploded. Ultimately there is a rather, um, I would call it a rather crabbed, although sometimes witty, humorous voice in Patterson who's saying it's my game, it's my improvisation, he is a jazz musician after all, and your access is very limited. So on that cheerful note, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll end. Thank you. I am. Or indeed enlightenment for me. <laughs> Tell me the key to reading <laughs> Patterson. You may be right, I'll tell you in all honesty, my honours students, many of them would struggle with some of these poems. 
So and absolutely. Bring to it. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, it may be the case. One other interesting editorial intervention he makes, he, he co-edits New British Poetry, which kind of relates to Cool Britannia and Brit Rock of the late 90s. And he does this very willful anthology where um, he got into a lot of trouble for this. The introduction is worth looking at for yourselves if you're going to teach Patterson, where he says, uh, he, he makes contradictory noises about poetry being accessible and for the man in the street and at the same time in that introduction he sounds a bit snobbish and people are kind of divided on where he's coming from and I think like a lot of writers and no harm to him, I mean I think he's a wonderful writer technically, he doesn't entirely know who his audience is and I don't think necessarily is the job of a writer to know who his or her audience is but um, he's, he's made contradictory noises um, about that and ultimately often he does descend into this well even in his poetry into this gesture of I've written it and I'm going to be completely ungiving and it's up to you what you do with it which in a sense is fair enough I suppose We were actually at a reading of his last week in Aberdeen mm-hmm. he just said that if I understand my poems to go in the bin if I don't <laughs> understand it, it it becomes a poem he was very obscure but he did engage two groups of um, pupils. All right, well, that's and good. I'm currently teaching him in the order that we've just right. talked about the band. Okay. They have been totally engaged with the first four. Well, that's great. I'm a bit fear at the next two, but... <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I, feel, I feel reassured in my own sanity. Um, I get more grumpy and middle-aged every day, so that I think I almost genuinely believe that the only good writer is a dead writer. Um, it's also the case that I've stopped going to poetry readings because they're so incestuous. Contemporary poets sit and give readings and make in-jokes for other poets. And it really is, as the private eye might have it, it's great thoughts being thunk by great minds. And there's something about modern poetry, it might just be my middle age, I've got very little sympathy for it at all, although I do admire Patterson's panache. Robert mentioned this morning how accessible and likeable Burns is. Burns is a brilliant technician, but... Um, at the same time, he is accessible. And there's the strange thing, an 18th century poet being more accessible than a 20th century one. Who would have thunk it? But at least that's good <laughs> if you can do those four poems, which I would agree are teachable, probably at, um, with a good senior class. Yeah. Any more? Given that that's the case then, mm-hmm. how is it going to be marked? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you can within within reason, but I mean they're just. I mean, I, I gen- the book edited by Natalie Pollard begins to give us a critical framework for the first time in which we can read Patterson. So that would be helpful if you are teaching Patterson. I would genuinely recommend getting a hold of of, of that book. But um, well, it's just it's, it's difficult potentially in every level. I mean, I don't know who chose Patterson, who, as I say, I admire. But I think someone probably rightly came to the conclusion we need to stretch the time frame, we need an early 21st century poet and that's well and good. And he might be the best of those, but I'm not sure he is one I would choose for for schools as such. Is that off message, Ronnie? Sounds perceptive to me. Um, I'm just wondering if a way into, is it Baldovin, you pronounce it? I'm not from that part of the, the world. I mean, it's, um, there'll be people here with Angus connections. Yeah, Baldovin. Baldovin. Yeah, that's what Baldovin. I always took it to be. Baldovin. I was just wondering if a way in would be Alan Spencer's short story, The Ferry, mm-hmm. about the two boys who uh-huh. go on the ferry from Govan across yeah. the Arctic. And yeah. I mean, it's, it's a much more straightforward text. I think, but, yeah. I mean, as soon as I you read and yeah. talked about Baldovin, yeah. immediately came into my mind Alan Spencer's The Ferry, which is a very, very yes. accessible text. Well, I think you're, you're, you're right, Lana. You're doing exactly the thing that I was doing there, propping up Patterson with other texts, mm-hmm. whether it's Tom Leonard, whether it's Edwin Muir, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's fine to do that because Patterson makes me nervous. 
and all kinds of ways. Um, I first appeared with him on radio in 1980, 1990, I think, where I was defending um, the, the recent Jamaican wave of poetry, including Linton Kwesi Johnson, you know, England is a bitch, England is a bitch. And, and Don was having nothing of this. He sounded a bit like the kind of elder son of T.S. Eliot. He wanted tradition <laughs> and form. And I'm not, into, I'm not having a, I think he's a wonderful poet, but there's something very, very traditional and ongiving about him even as the way he looks, as though he's speaking in very modern ways. And I haven't been able to suss out, is this guy really modern and hip, or is he actually quite old-fashioned? And maybe he's allowed to be a bit of both. Any other questions? Once again, thanks very much, Jay. Definitely.